Good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of Cult Classic uh, Movies. Uh, we're going back into the vault now this week in terms of looking back in terms of time classics and we're looking at a real sort of a sci-fi type action type horror sort of movie. It's the one and only the vampire sort of action flick back in 1998, the only one and only Blade. Some of its cast members, obviously, the main cast billing was Wesley Snipes, who played Blade, with Stephen Dorff, who played Deacon Frost, Chris Christopherson, who played Whistler, and the one and only, and our guest this evening, Donna Logue, who played Quinn, uh, the antagonist uh, to Wesley Snipes, and one of Wesley Snipes' Blade's main rivals uh, in the movie. Uh, Donal, 22 years ago since yeah. the first Blade, <laughs> I was only watching it there last sort of week. It, you might think a decade, but more than two decades now. It doesn't yeah. almost feel that long. And it's phenomenal because, you know, that was really the first Marvel movie. And they were kind of on the ropes at the time. Blade turned everything around. So all of this Avengers Endgame and the Iron Mans and all the amazing movies that we've gotten from Marvel in the years since, um, you know, Blade was the start. And I, I know with Black Panther, which was phenomenal, but people kind of forgot that Wesley Snipes and Blade were the first, and not only that, but the first African-American, you know, superhero um, on film in that kind. And Stephen Norrington, who directed it, I, I think you can vouch for this. The, it, when you saw it last week, or it, it holds up so phenomenally well. It was such an amazing movie. Um, what was funny was it didn't have a big budget. It really had no budget for visual effects, which were so different 22 years ago. And what little budget that they, they had kind of got squandered on this one company that I think blew the VFX the first go round. So yes, <laughs> the, the visual effects can be a little janky at the end of the movie, but um, the movie is so strong and so phenomenal that I think people ride with that. I've, I've gotten so much love from Blade over the course of, you know, since 1998 that um, I'm so fortunate to have been part of that. And I will say the most fun I've ever had on a set filming a movie ever easily, hands down. And uh, Donald, um, I know it's a long time ago now, but how did the opportunity come about for you to get involved in Blade? Is there a good story behind it? Is there, there a good bit of... A face or a good... Yeah, man, James, there's a kind of a good story. You know, I had, a, I had long hair at the time. Okay. And I was hanging out in my house with my friend Greg Dooley and his friend Justine Chiaro, who's a friend of mine. And she's like, you know, you should braid your hair like Snoop Dogg. This sounds so... Uh, I'm so sorry if this sounds like such a vacuous story. And so I was joking around. I had a leather jacket, no shirt, a cowboy hat, these braids. And I'm like, oh, damn, I, got, I have an audition for this thing called Blade. And, um, and, and uh, Greg was like, you should go like that, dude. You know, so he's sitting there smoking a cigarette. So I roll down to the audition like this, and I go in, and there are these guys wearing kind of just slacks and polo shirts and going over the Quinn lines. And Stephen Norrington steps out of the office, and he sees me, and he goes, that's fucking Quinn. Excuse my language. I'm so sorry. No problem. Okay, that's that's Quinn. And I can feel the deflation of everybody else in the room, you know. And then we got to talking, and he said that what he really wanted, because there wasn't a lot on the page for this character, but he wanted it to be like a strong, um, There's there was this kind of cool, dark, metronomic beats going on with Blade and other characters, but he wanted this character to be like a streak of color through the tapestry of the film and a little bit of the comic relief. So he gave me a license to kind of go big. And then um, Steven Dorff and I immediately hit it off. He, I think he's a phenomenal actor. We had a lot of fun and we created our own little family and world there. And um, with Arlie Hover and Boucher Wright, and uh, of course uh, with Chris and with Wesley and so, you know, I, I, I'm really proud of my involvement with Blade, but how I got the part was just 
dressing super weird, man, and going for it and walking down there. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to, a character starts from the outside in, and sometimes it's the opposite. And the character of Quinn, uh, he, he's your portrayal of him, he comes off uh, an air of sort of invincibility, a real tough sort of a cookie in terms of a vampire, in terms of uh, strength. And normally you think of vampires, you think of them being frail, being sort of vicious. But this guy could hold his own in a, a sort of a, a strongman competition. He was almost that sort of a, a, a vampire as such. A very sort of... A, unusual sort of a type of a, 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 a almost like a James Bond type of a henchman for, for, a, for a vampire if you get my drift. Yeah. Um, you know, that stuff was so that stuff was always so fun. I have to say there was a lot obviously of fighting in Blade, a lot of martial arts and things and um, it, it's always been, for me, I've always loved that kind of side of things and just jumping in as much as you can with all the fight sequences and everything. And, uh, but yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because I never, I never stopped to think about what vamp I've never stopped to think about what vampires were portrayed as, or when I did Gotham, I didn't study old animated Batmans to see what Bullock was about or on the new resident evil I'm doing as chief irons. I kind of leave whatever, um, incarnation of a character behind and I just try and do my own thing and ha have fun with it and it 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 seems to kind of just if you if you allow it it kind of tells you how it's supposed to be played you know um, but I I I just thought this is this is a stupid and shallow kind of thought but I just thought wouldn't it kind of be cool to be a vampire wouldn't it kind of be fun you know, and that was yeah. Quinn. I think Quinn really enjoyed um, being able to wander among, you know, among the normal, uh, the day walkers, et cetera. The, like to be able to, uh, to just roll through and, and have fun and do what he wanted. He wasn't very, he wasn't afraid of anything except for Blade. Blade was so formidable. Yeah, and I suppose uh, in terms of uh, action uh, movies, and you mentioned Marvel and you mentioned type of superhero type of movies, and sometimes in, to in terms of that, there can be an almost like overkill in the movie in terms of loaded with too many characters, too many good characters, too many bad characters, people trying to going from character to character to try and get a sense of the movie. In Blade, it's just so precise. You know who the good guys are. You know who the bad guys are. There's not 10 bad guys. There's not eight or nine cast of a no. good guys. And it sort of runs through. You can identify the plot. It's very easy to catch on. If you're watching with the five, first five or 10 minutes, you can see the way it's sort of uh, developing as such. So you can, almost, you can almost follow the course of the story of the film. It reads itself. I, I, I agree with you. Um, I was such a fan with the simplicity of the way the story laid out, even though that there were, that there were wrinkles and elements and things that they were attempting to do. And, um, Sana Lathan's character and is, is like explaining some of Wesley's backstory, but you had the good guy camp and the bad guy camp, and they kept butting heads from the get go from the blood club, you know. And um, yeah, what a what a blast that whole that year was. When I look back on it, it was 1997, and we started shooting it in January of 97 in LA. And I got to work on, um, after that, I went to go work on Thin Red Line in Australia. And then I did a movie in Thailand called the, uh, A Bright Shining Lie about Vietnam, the Vietnam War. And 1997 was absolutely the apex of the incredible gift and joy it was to travel around and do these creative things. And um, oh, by the way, on The Bright Shining Lie, there was a huge Irish component in Thailand to the crew. There was the famous uh, Conroy family. There was Jack Conroy was one of the super DPs of Irish film, The Field and all kinds of amazing films. And Jack was the DP and his son was an AC. And, um, you know, the Con I, I just have to do a shout out to the Conroy family because they're all 
involved in film. They're amazing. And uh, Emer was the script supervisor of uh, Viking. So hello, miss you all. And so um, I got to see a lot of the Thailand crew back on Vikings, weirdly enough. So I, I really miss Ireland, man. I was supposed to go back in October, but the flights have been kind of jumbled and bungled because of COVID, et cetera, and the, the quarantining. But I will, I will be back very soon. Um, Donald, in terms of 1998 now, I suppose for um, Wesley Snipes, it was probably the prime of his career. And yeah. uh, I know his still career is ongoing, but he's not really been involved in much projects as of late in the last five or six or six years. Well, it, Dolomite. It, Dolom Did you see Dolomite? I saw Dolomite, yeah. yeah. I saw the great movie. I, I um, mean, I honestly thought that was Oscar-worthy nomination for Wesley. Um, but I think he'll be back, you know? I mean, the funniest thing about Wesley is that he's such a powerful, dramatic actor. He came from this really vaunted uh, program at State University in New York at Purchase, where there's just an amazing group of actors and directors came out of that university. And Wesley was just, he, he's the, maybe one of the strongest dramatic actors ever. And because he had such an affinity for the martial arts, et cetera, and such command and control of his body, he got into the action hero stuff. But maybe now, um, as time has gone on, he'll be able to, because he's still young, you know, he'll be able to provide a couple of decades of some cool performances. So I look forward to, I look forward to that. And uh, back in 1998, was that the first time you'd ever worked with uh, Wesley Snipes? Was that the first time you ever came across him in terms yeah. of one-to-one? -one? Yeah, it was funny because he was... Um, so I have a friend named Robert Burke whose parents are from Galway. So we, we kind of bonded on an Oliver Stone movie in Thailand in 1992. We kind of bonded on the Irish parentage, you know, thing. And uh, Robert was Wesley's roommate in college. And Robert himself is a insanely tough, you know, many layered black belt of many degree um, in martial arts. And he and Wesley used to fight all the time and love each other, you know. And um, so when I when uh, I started working with Wesley, he might have been not quite as close with everyone else, but he knew Robert and I were best friends, and so. I was in like Flynn with Wesley, which was great because we had a lot of stuff to do together. But, you know, um, because I was Robert Burke's best friend, you know, that put me in with Wesley. So so I felt like I knew him a little bit when I met him at the set. And your character, Quinn, had some real gripping moments uh, throughout Blade uh, from the hospital scene in terms yeah. of... Uh, the, the morgue sort of scene, the sort of coming back to life, to the actual sort of uh, fight scene and the sort of underground sort of uh, where you sort of meet your demise. Uh, that was just mainly, I almost felt like a, a black and white sort of scenario. It was just an empty sort of shell in, in terms of, and let, let the two of you go at it. There was no stunning backdrops, no sort of uh, any term in terms of getting yourself distracted from what was going on. It was a fight to the death. It was yourself versus Blade. And it was the unique sort of, the scenic sort of setting that was just basically emptiness all around. And then you could yeah. see your character and his character. And sometimes you see in all these type of movies, there's big cliffs, there's big sort of rigs, there's big graveyards yeah. and what you think might happen in a vampire movie and stuff like that. But this was like, practically underground parking lot, an empty sort of parking lot, and wham, bam, who's going to yeah. stand, who's going to come out? There was a pretty good one with uh, when we were in the subway tunnel where the train was an element in the um, fight, and he held me up, he smacked me up against the passing subway train cars. But, um, you know, and of course I lost my left arm I don't know how many times during the course of the movie and it kept growing back, but what an out, you know, and I, I will say this about the resident evil reboot that we're working on right now, that there is this not responsibility, but you know, there's a, there are, there are times when you're on something like this and you realize the super, the value of the escapism and the just committing to that, fictitious world that's un, 
being unveiled, you know, and bringing as much color or humor or whatever you can to the project. And um, I have a feeling on this film that I'm working on right now, I have a similar feeling between this and, and the excitement of being on Blade. So okay. it'll be Good pretty stuff. exciting. Uh, it'll be fun to uh, unveil this, you know? And then I'm going on to do a little movie called All My Puny Sorrows, which was about, it's a, it's a stunningly moving and poignant and depressing novel, Canadian novel. And so I love bouncing out these different, balancing these different types of projects. And, um, you know, some are more artistic and poetic and poignant, and some are just a blast and a, you know, like a thrill ride at an, at an amusement park. Um, Donald, we've spoken about your character. We've spoken about Wesley's character. I just want to bring up uh, Chris uh, Christopherson Whistler, um, yeah. an acting sort of icon, a uh, sort of uh, a legend in the talk yeah. type of business in terms of his sort of uh, body of work. And uh, yeah. back in 1998, I suppose uh, for actors getting involved in the cast and being involved in something, you hear Chris Christopherson is in the sort of movie. Obviously, there's a sense of uh, I would I say, dare I say, butterflies in the stomach, uh, knowing that you're going to be doing uh, on set with Chris Kiftofson? A hundred percent. You know, when we, I remember the read through and I remember seeing, you know, meeting Chris at the read through and what a what a guy, you know, and I knew the backstory. I, I'm a huge Chris Kiftofson fan of especially his, you know, his what Chris was famous for in the United States was songwriting. And, um, and he's, it was, you know, he's a Rhodes Scholar and he was a veteran and he was, you know, a helicopter pilot. I mean, this guy is, uh, he's erudite, he's an academic, he's, uh, you know, with Willie Nelson and uh, Waylon Jennings, mm. he was embraced as, as country music royalty. He's a, a poet and, um, yeah, so we all had that kind of awe of Chris Christopherson. And of cool, he's a of course he's a great guy, you know, and had no airs about him. But it was it, you know, he is. He's a he's American. Um, not, you know, acting, of course he's a great actor and he's and and the star is born and all the different things that he's done, but it was his songwriting, his presence as one of the kind of great American songwriters that I think we hold them all in such uh, awe for, but it's it was it was incredible to meet him. And I suppose, um, Donald, uh, we're going into the stage now. We're in 2021, where you mentioned that you're involved in a Resident Evil sort of reboot uh, in terms of movies. Uh, we've seen uh, Blade uh, movies come out. We've seen uh, Blade Two. We've seen uh, different sort of remits. Uh, do you think they've done everything they can do with the sort of Blade franchise? Is there any sort of avenue? I know sometimes at movies they say classics are the best left unturned. Well, they're, his, you know, uh, they're, doing, they're doing Blade again. They're they're revitalizing Blade, the franchise. So in terms of be, a TV series or a no, movie, I think it's going to be. It, I think it's going to be a film. I think it might be even a number of films. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna look real fast. Let me see. I didn't lose you, did I? Are you still there? No, no, still here, yeah. Well, hold on a second, because I think I just pressed something and blew it. Um, well, I can't see myself, but if you can still see me, that's good. I can still see you, yeah. Um, Blade reboot. So, yes. Yes, there's going to be, I think there's going to be a Blade re reboot. Okay. And... Uh, Marshala Ali, the guy that was in, um, did you ever see Moonlight? I've heard of it. I haven't seen it, but it's definitely, so, so I came this, across This phenomenal actor is going to be the new Blade. And uh, I don't know if you saw, um, yeah, so they're doing it and it's going to be, it's going to be great because I think now with Marvel, they have such a an understanding of how of how um, 
how to do these movies so well, you have absolutely, you get the best of the best involved in these, in these. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look up his IMDB and see if he's definitely on board for Blade. It's, it would be so exciting to see if it's, yes, Blade, absolutely. And I don't know if you saw um, True Detective or, anyway, this actor is phenomenal. He's, he's one of the few greats going right now. And uh, the, I have no doubt that this is gonna be an amazing reboot. I don't know if, you know, I, what I don't know is if they'll reach out to any of us to see if um, we want to, you know, I think it would be pretty janky to have kind of like the old cast come in as as uh, doing cameos or whatever, but maybe Deacon Frost, as he's grown older, will come back. And uh, I suppose, uh, Donald, I suppose, lastly, before I let you go, in terms of uh, summar summarizing the whole Blade experience in 1998, and if I can condense it for you, if I could put you a challenge, and I say to you, uh, sum up the whole journey of Blade for you in that sort of 1998, if you could summarize it into two sentences, I know that's an awful hard thing to do. What would you like, what would those two sentences best describe your time in Blade? You, you mean the actual time of filming it? Yeah, of, you, for, for, for your time on the project to the time that you finished in terms of the premiere and you saw the sort of final sort of final sort of project and you departed on to other sort of projects. What would, what would summarize, if you could put it into two sentences? Um, it, was, it was absolutely unbridled joy and goofy and insane and fun and laughter filled and maybe a kind of Hollywood that doesn't exist anymore. Kind of the last of the old school Hollywood, a lot of stunt people, a lot of guys, a lot of um, partying and now partying has kind of stopped. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it certainly gives, I think the Blade Run not only was it cool in the making, it gave us all a little bit of cool cred for the last 22 years. Uh, on that note, uh, Donald, uh, I'll finish up and saying, uh, let's hope uh, 2021 brings back the parties for us all, I know, uh, in terms of uh, beginning to relive our sort of lives in, in terms yeah. of that. But uh, Donald Logue, an absolute pleasure. Uh, a big shout out to all your fans in Ireland and especially the Kerry contingent as well. Yes, uh, no doubt uh, tu tu tuning in. And uh, Donald Thank Logue. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, having me. And thanks yeah, and for Do Donald Logue, the classic movies back into the vaults this week. Blade, 1998, sci-fi, vampire, action, horror, action, thriller, you name it. It had everything. One of the main characters was the one and only Quinn, played by Donald Logue. And uh, Donald, an absolute pleasure for sharing your memories with us today. God bless and have a prosperous 2021. God bless you. And let's see. We'll see each other in 2021, okay? Cheers. Take care, Donald. Bye-bye.